Hello and welcome. We're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at uh, writing about feature articles, and we're going to be mainly looking at uh, the two types of questions you'll be probably given about a um, a feature article, which is first of all to uh, critically analyze how a writer's opinion is made. And the second one is, of course, how it actually addresses you, the audience. So it's a relationship between um, language and opinion. So how this is communicated through use of different kinds of techniques and different types of language, and then how this interacts with you, how it interacts with an audience. So. For instance, if it was to use figurative language or if it was used to um, use different metaphors or, so, or something along those lines, why does it use them? Why does it um, require those to address you and what effect does that create and how does that represent their opinion? So you're looking at all those things um, together that it's really a discussion between, first of all, what a writer's opinion is and second of all, how they communicate that to you. Okay, so that's those two things. Their opinion and how they communicate it to you. Okay, so let's look at, first of all, the writer. Now, while their background is generally quite unimportant, you don't really need to focus too much on their background, if at all. One thing you should really look at is why their opinion is trusted. And often it's because that they have some sort of authority, they have some sort of experience, they have something which uh, enables other people, other readers, their audiences, to trust what they say and to believe what they say. So whether they be in a position that they're the editor of the newspaper or whether they just be someone who is a respected figure or a respected columnist, uh, you've got to look at actually why that opinion is trusted and how you can actually tell that opinion is trusted because generally they'll talk in a certain way. They'll talk as, a, as an authority in that matter. So, for instance, if you look at a political journalist or correspondent, they will talk about um, politics in the way that they are an authority on it because they've reported on it for so long that they know so much about it that they are um, trusted in that particular field to talk about these issues. So, even though you don't really need to actually talk about their background, you should talk about how their authority actually affects what they say. Cruci or crucially, should I say, their opinion is often supported with evidence and it does things like resonates with readers and stimulates public debate. Now, when I say often support it with evidence, some their evidence is a little bit um, touch and go, so to speak. However, the rest is, um, is, is something that all columnists do, that they resonate with their readers in some way, that they, they talk to them, they have some sort of impact on them. And secondly, they stimulate public debate. So what they're trying to do is trying to get their opinion their ideas, their ways of thinking, and then what they're trying to do is sort of throw that on their audience and say, um, carry on the good work, but more importantly, believe what I say, um, look at this as being important, look at this as something that you should be valuing as much as I do, because that's ultimately what people do when they stand on their soapbox and, and, and talk at people and, and um, trying to have conversations with them, is they're trying to... Um, tell them of their point of view and how um, things should be looking. And often that's what happens, is they'll write about it in such a way where they will communicate their opinion and they will do it in such a way where they're really, their ultimate goal is to get others to spread their opinion and for that opinion uh, to be part of the, I guess, the public debate and also to be an opinion leader, as in if my opinion gets communicated through a newspaper and then suddenly other people start to think that way, then ultimately that shows the success of that columnist and obviously their authority as well. The other thing you've got to look at is how the argument is sequenced. And first of all, you've got to look at the how, which is that they're always a personal argument. They are structured so one point leads on to the next. So these are the things which are almost immediately, um, they're part of every argument. So they're put, Every argument given by a person is personal, obviously. The other thing is that they are structured so one leads on to the next, like all good arguments should. And if you ever write an essay, then obviously you're going to be trying to do that sort of thing as well and trying to communicate your own ideas in such a way where other people can follow them. They're informally sequenced a lot of the time, so they don't necessarily um, have to follow a structure like you would, for instance, for an essay. They can be sequenced in any way that 
takes their fancy. They use background analogies, facts, and other sources to prove their point. So these are all the ways that a, a, a writer will construct their argument using all of these characteristics. Personal, but they'll do so in such a way where it's a fairly logical argument, all right, that they, um, they don't have to be formally sequenced, but they do have to go from one to the next, and then they'll use evidence to prove it. So this is essentially this, your discussion, and this is how they, they prove it. This is their evidence. The effect of this is, first of all, that an argument focuses directly on representing the writer's perspective. They don't mince their words and they go straight to the point. They use evidence in such a way where it appeals to an audience's interest. As in, if you're just going to keep bombarding people with statistics, most people will turn off. Whereas uh, ones who often write feature articles, and if you ever read one, you often see them being used in such a way where they will... Um, outline their point of view first, they'll represent it, um, their own ideas and they'll represent their own perspective and then they'll give their evidence to prove it. It's also a nice handy model to take if you're actually doing essay writing because that's exactly the same thing you should be doing for an essay as well. And finally, they speak directly to readers. They try and have a heart to heart with them. It's not a lecture because if you're lecturing to someone about something, then they're going, again, they're going to tune out. And if you get in your high horse about it, then you're also going to tune out. Whereas a journalist and, and those who write feature articles are generally smart enough to know that if they get on their high horse and claim to be better than everyone else, then most people will take that as a sign to say, oh, well, I don't really need your opinion then. So they'll try and speak directly and have a heart to heart with their readers and sort of um, make them feel like this is something that matters to them as much as it matters to whoever wrote it and whoever um, its perspective it is. So... They do it using a number of ways, and the language is also quite important. They use devices such as, as I mentioned before, figurative language. As in, they try and represent it in such a way where everyone can visualize it. And it's one of the most important things about figurative language is it helps to visualize certainly a lot of abstract concepts, and certainly ones that are often quite difficult. And you have to remember that one of the points often the feature articles is to represent things which are um, important for public debate, but often there are times where those um, issues they're discussing are complicated, that they require a bit of explanation in order to get their point across. And so figurative language is a very handy device for those writers to use in order to get their point across. And sort of think about how abstract, so things that you can't see are represented in ways that you can see them. For instance, if you're saying that the, um, if you're talking about the economy and it's going down and you can say it's plunging into a black hole, Okay, we can imagine a black hole that's plunging into, that means it's going down, and that's a visual way of representing something which we can't see. We can't see the economy, but we can see whatever that image is. It uses humour and analogies as well. They do it in such a way where um, they not only use basically figurative language in that sense, but they compare it to other stories, other events, in such a way where if we can visualise those events, then obviously we can get the point across, and obviously humour. Um, so they try and make it quirky, they try and make it interesting, they try and appeal to our, uh, our sense of fun and particularly if it's a particularly um, horrible topic or something that um, is very hard to discuss, then sometimes humour can best get that point across. Of course there are mostly times where you wouldn't do that because of the fact that it is a sensitive topic and you want to be discussing it in a sensitive way, but there are times as well where humour does help. Um, deliver the message. Anecdotes. It is a method of storytelling, so their language is often going to be quite anecdotal, and um, that language is something which helps to connect with their readers. They use second person syntax, so they're addressing it as you. You, you, you. You should think the way that I do. They'll also use words like we, you, and us, oh, sorry, we, us, and our as well. And the reason they do that is to feel like it, I'm not only talking to you, I'm at one with you. I'm like you, I live in the same city, I eat the same food and drink the same um, water, all those sorts of things. So therefore, um, we're together on this. And that's how it sort of reaches out and has that heart to heart. And that's what the language is ultimately trying to do. And emotional language, obviously, it pretty much connects to that very idea that it's something that people should feel emotional about and readers, those who are responding to these articles, 
will have an emotional engagement in some sense, whether it's because of their own feelings, their own um, attitudes and prejudices, whatever it may be, they will have their own reaction to it. The effect is obviously, first of all, entertainment and interest value. Ultimately, more than anything, a columnist is a form of entertainment. There's something that gets people to click on them, gets um, someone looking, opening up to their section of the newspaper and wanting to read more about what they say. So it does have both entertainment and interest value. Often, even if it's a, a fairly boring or a topic that not many people really care about, they'll still try and represent in such a way that those who do care about it are interested, do follow on and read it, and get some sort of entertainment value. It helps to pass the time. It's inclusive of their audience. It doesn't sort of say that it's us and them. It's trying to include it as everyone as us. It provides an interesting and personal account, which, as I said, connects with readers. So it resonates. It's something that a, a reader who will be looking at this article, who will be reading this article, will go, oh, wow, well, yeah, they, they get me. And that's ultimately what um, a newspaper uh, columnist is trying to do, to sort of say, yeah, they get me. They understand how I think too. And, and what they're doing is they're making a lot of sense to me and they're really representing how I should be thinking. Now, finally, their use of sources. Uh, first of all, they use quite expert knowledge, either their own or from an expert source. So the evidence that they use, it doesn't come from some bloke on the street. It comes from something that's reputable, something that is well known, something which is quite prominent. And if they are an expert in that field, then of course they'll use their own um, opinion and their own analysis. Something that says that I at least know what I'm talking about, and if I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to find someone who does. They use facts such as statistics and scientific findings. So they'll use things which um, can be proven, can be proven logically, that no one can really debate. And they'll use analogies such as stories, quotes, events, both recent and historic. So as I mentioned before, those sources um, relate to something, for instance, in history. And... It may just use history as a yardstick for what may happen next, especially if it's trying to speculate. And if you say that this is going to do this, if it's, if it's happened before, then they'll often bring that, um, that example up again and say, well, this is what happened the last time um, someone tried to swim across the entire ocean. They drowned. Okay, so the next person is going to try and do it. It's probably going to end up having the same sort of fate. The effect is, first of all, um, use of expert sources, and of course, if they have an expert opinion to start with, it provides validation of their opinion. So if they know what they're talking about, if the reader gets that impression that they know what they're talking about, then obviously that opinion is validated. For instance, if you're writing a sports column and it's written by an athlete, then it's validation that because they are an athlete and they're in the middle of that field, that um, their opinion is valid and it's current because obviously they're the ones taking part in it. Um, use of analogies often gives a point of reference or, or a comparison, so something that other people can go, oh, okay, I can see how these, these two are con connected. And finally, provide a background or even possibly a humorous link as well. And those things, all those um, sources together, not only make the, the opinion valid, but they make it um, something which gives a point of reference, something that they can compare it to, something that they can use to validate it. And finally, something that makes it interesting, something that gives a bit more information so that point comes across. Now, in terms of writing your response to a feature article, you need to do a couple of things. Mostly, you need to draw links between a feature article, so what the feature article is actually presented, what the actual text does, and the effect of these things that are written, and how ultimately will connect with you. As I mentioned before, the main purpose of a feature article is to get someone's perspective, someone's opinion, and deliver it to you and have you receive it. So you'll be discussing this process and how that works. So first of all, argument and sequencing is um, how an article basically represents a rise perspective and how they arrange it is often quite important. And it's important for the sense that they are trying to communicate directly to their readers. So first of all, the writer's perspective should be fairly obvious. And if it isn't, then you still need to state it anyway, whether it's obvious or not. And then how they arrange it 
refers to actually how they're trying to deliver that point of view and how they're trying to deliver it in such a way that other, others who read it will take it on board. The language used by an article writer and the way it is both inclusive of a reader and engages them. Okay, so when you're referring to how language is used, first of all, it's language that's going to um, connect with the reader, as in if you're trying to um, write for a sophisticated audience, for, for starters, then you'd be using more sophisticated language that's inclusive of their beliefs and their values, it's inclusive of the fact that they're educated, and it engages them in that highly intellectual argument. Of course, if you're not writing for um, an, a highly intellectual person, if you're just writing for someone who, if you're just writing for your average, um, average bloke, average person, average lady, average child, average whoever, then you would try and speak in their language, speak in a way that you actually understand them, and that's what feature article writers generally do. So, for instance, often if you see something like a feature article in a car magazine, for instance, they'll go straight for the jargon, they won't treat them like idiots, because if they treat them like idiots, then they'll essentially turn off and go, well, hang on, he's treating me like an idiot, this guy's not for me. And finally, their use of sources is important. So how sources and evidence are used often influence the effect of the article. Okay, so how they actually connect, how they actually um, make it sound valid or perhaps invalid if they haven't used the right kinds of sources. You need to be critical of that. You need to think of how valid it actually makes and how expert these sources are. If they keep referring to unnamed, unknown sources, then you might as well say, well, they could have been just as easily making it up because really all they're providing is a lot of conjecture and hearsay. They're not actually providing any sort of truth or evidence to back it up. So in summary, you must think about articles critically. And this is what you need to do. You need to be very critical of that process between what happens between um, the journalist's hand or the columnist's hand and what you read. You need to make links between the text and you, the reader. So actually how it's trying to talk to you or talk to an audience directly. And finally, analyze the effectiveness of what is written. And really um, critique and, and think carefully about whether it actually creates an effect whether it actually does sort of get your opinion on board. I mean, you don't have to talk about it in a personal sense, but how it actually does get its point across. And finally, really um, discuss how effective that point is and how a writer is effective in delivering it. But otherwise, that's it for um, feature articles and how to write about them. So until next time, I'll see you later.